one of the things that we were talking about yesterday in preparation, uh, John, is you mentioned the importance of, you know, reducing friction in the existing ecosystems. You don't have to force new ones. And that, that sort of resonated with me because even some of the clients that, that I deal with in the tech space, they, they, they have these great ideas. And then they want to create this massive ecosystem to sort of roll out their particular vision uh, through the, you know, that, that thought as to, to why we maybe want to start with our existing ecosystem, see what we can do to go ahead and, and make those work before we jump into building something completely, completely brand new. Yeah. I mean, my, um, my good, uh, a good colleague of mine, Peter Watkins, who's uh, just a really great guy and a giant brain here in BC, probably the reason I moved here. Um, uh, he he said, you know what, John, like whatever you're doing, you can't uh, cause a terraforming of the IT infrastructure of government. You know, we've got hundreds and hundreds of applications on platforms ranging from, you know, mainframes to cloud native. And uh, if whatever it is we were coming up with required everybody to rewire their entire set of systems, that's a non-starter. So in terms of adoption, we're taking, a, we, we're doing our best to have an additive situation where we add things to existing services that enable them to uh, develop these digital relationships with their constituents um, in an incremental fashion. Um, you can kind of think of it as like a print driver, add, add this new print driver to your system and you now can issue and verify these new uh, credentials. So that's kind of an approach we're taking in terms of adoption. The other thing that's really a challenge is um, helping people unlearn the last horrible 40 years of computing. <laughs> um, we've, 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 um, we've learned how to deal with the, uh, def you know, there's a lot of great things about technology, of course, that, that we've benefited from, but as we've um, moved beyond the enterprise border, um, we've, we've now, um, we're now experiencing these kinds of issues that we raise, you know, as we move into the global situation and we're having to commute trust across enterprise borders, across jurisdictional borders. And that's really what this, this uh, challenge is about. So there's a, there's a learning curve here. And, and usually what I say is just forget about what you know about computing. Let's go back to the way we work as humans. We develop relationships. We build up trust in those relationships. And sometimes when we, when we enter into a formal relationship, we require our counterparty to provide evidence of whether it is you know, who they are or that they're a legal entity or they're an authorized signing authority for their legal entity or whatever, right? This is a very normal pattern. And um, this technology aligns with that way of doing things. So I think this is a big benefit. And if we you know, learn how to um, provide a good user experience around that, um, then I think we're, you know, in good shape. It's, it's early days, but um, I feel confident that, um, that we can get there, that we have to get there, you know. And this situation today that we're all living in is just further evidence that we need a way to have trustworthy business over the internet. Like, there's only two models on the internet that are succeeding right now. Buying shoes and having your data exploited for advertising. And the reason you can buy shoes is because you have a credit card. So fundamentally, the trust is anchored in the transaction networks of payment processors. They don't really care who you are. They just care that you can pay. Um, and of course, d data exploitation. Well, I mean, that goes without explaining. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, Ryan, there's a, you were asked about ecosystem. There's a question in the, in the system here from Stephen Cox. It says, how does... Does the SSI model require some form of national identity provider to catalyze countrywide service? Um, and this is where the, the, the thing that John and I are both working towards is it would be great if there were, you know, in, in North America, if there were provincial and state issuers of driver's licenses and, you know, national, you know, passports that were doing this, but we don't need that today. It's going to get better when we do. As a business example, one of the surprising, another learning that came out of the, the credit union world is by definition of having a credit union account, if you are a credit union member, you have been KYC'd. Someone has gone through a legal process. They've signed up and said, I do, I've done and know your customer. They have different, uh, different acronyms behind that. But KYC means I am a person and I'm good enough to get a bank account. That signal alone, just the value of that, is not saying this is Daryl O'Donnell and here's my verified address and my driver's license capabilities and my height, all that type of stuff. Just simply that 
I'm Daryl O'Donnell, I'm a member of Credit Union X, in my case, Meridian. That signal alone is worthwhile to insurers. For example, health insurance companies, one of their number one modes of fraud is synthetic identity. So if they have somebody who's been a member of a credit union, say for 15 years, and they can get that information, they know that they have a far, lo far lower incidence of health fraud, and they're actually willing to pay the credit union a small amount of money, you know, measured not in dollars, but tens of dollars. Um, so it's not huge, but it adds up quickly because they receive immediate value. You start doing that, you start to build the ecosystem. And as groups like BC come on board with verifiable credentials, John has a verifiable credential version of his service card. It becomes even more powerful because I get to use that in a privacy respecting way and people start to use that. But you don't have to start by building the whole ecosystem and wait for somebody. There are probably problems you're facing right now that you can radically improve just one simple process. That's how you get, that's how you get started basically. Yeah, just to, to echo that Daryl, I, I think in, in a lot of these businesses with existing identity access management system and existing processes and stuff like that, it just, and like John said, it, it is an add-on. It, it should be an easy thing to just add on to what you're already doing just by offering that additional value, whether it's to your, to your customers, to your employees, or to the vendors that you're dealing with. Um, and so we were talking, obviously, in the explanation about verifiable credentials and wallets. Um, it, it seems like a chicken and egg problem. You need one to, to have the other one work very well. Um, I guess starting with wallets, and I would throw it back to you, Daryl, I, I would be interested in understanding your vision on where the whole wallet space is going and how people could adopt wallets today or what they should be thinking about. And for, for those who don't know, Daryl, wrote a fantastic report on uh, digital wallets last year, which I know he had a great time uh, writing from start to finish, but it's a, it, it's, a, it's a great report and I'm sure he could tell you how to download it. But what would you kind of give as advice, Daryl, to, to businesses that are looking to adopt self-sovereign identity and what, they, what should they do with wallets? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we wrote a, some of the people on the, on the call actually were part of the project where we kicked it off and, dug deep and looked at the problem. Everyone was saying the digital wallet's gonna solve this. It's the digital wallet, which apparently could do everything. And it turns out that digital wallets aren't well understood. But what we're seeing right now is there's really two types of wallets in this space. Um, ones that I would call generic are really for the geeks. They're ugly applications. It doesn't look and feel good like a wallet. I don't know how to use it. And there's these ideas that if I wanna give you my address, I get to decide, well, is that for my driver's license, my library card? My unit, I'm just share my address, please. I don't want to think. So where we're seeing a lot of adoption is what I would call an embedded mini wallet, where banking apps, for example, credit unions are taking some of their banking apps and embedding a wallet so that you don't as a member even know that there's a one, a very private and unique to you in the credit union communication channel. There's a digital credential sitting inside of this wallet that allows more protection. So you don't have to go and pull out a dongle and type in a six digit number or anything, but it's sitting there and making your life a lot easier because it's really used between you and just the credit union or you and just a business. So in your Instacart example, it would be just me and them. Where it gets interesting though, is if I wanna walk into another credit union or provide that, that to a health insurance company, that's where we'll find you'll have more generic kind of wallets that start to look and feel like a real physical wallet. And there's a whole bunch of detail. And, and Matthew was uh, alluding to the fun I had. Uh, I had temper tantrums writing. I don't do reports. I, I cannot tell you how allergic I am to them. Um, I was a miserable person, but it's out. And it's like 80 something pages. Um, but if anybody wants it, I'll, I'll drop a link in on, on, the, uh, on the chat here too. If, um, if someone uses an embedded wallet um, with their clients and they have a relationship directly with their clients, if they start issuing credentials to to their customers, yeah. um, could uh, could these credentials be used elsewhere? Like we, we keep talking about the portability, about how would it work in the real world? They certainly can, and we're starting to see that right now. This is where John and I were by no means at different ends of the spectrum, but we're both pushing forward to make sure that this interoperability that my my credit union app will work with a generic wallet and work with a with a, a health application. Um, 
we're helping define and Governor BC just stood up and, and, and is a founding member of a new foundation called the Trust Over IP Foundation, where we're starting to set those standards so that we don't all have to reinvent how do I ask for a credential. A digital wallet is really great if I can put everything in it, but if I can't, if you can't ask to see something in it, it doesn't help me. It's just a database. You need to have a, an electronic way of saying, could I please see that prepaid Visa card? And John, and uh, maybe you want to speak a little bit to Trust Over IP Foundation, because that's really what that's all about, so that we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. We can just show the patterns. Here's how you get a driver's license. Here's how you show a corporate registration type of thing. You want to talk about Trust Over IP, John? Um, sure. I'm just, uh, I also wanted to provide an example. I'm, I'm getting itchy uh, talking. I want to share my screen here. Okay. Well, let and, me stop uh, sharing my screen, John, so you can do it. Because uh, I'm a big fan of uh, big fan of clicky things, as Daryl knows. So I want to give a real world, you know, sort of a coming real world example. We're working with the Law Society of British Columbia and the BC Court Service, um, and the challenge there is that uh, as a result of a Supreme Court ruling a year ago, um, bail review hearings must be held every 30 days, no matter what. They were taking too long, and it was violating. Uh, the folks who were being held without bail's uh, constitutional rights. This is going to create uh, extra demand on the court systems, and it requires the, the lawyer who's representing the defendant um, to have access to the audio recordings that the government holds in their systems to do the research they need. Um, and so they need to get access to that online, which they currently don't have. And the government only wants to provide by lawyers with that information. So how do I prove I'm a lawyer online? Um, well, even if I have strong digital identity and I know your name, that doesn't mean you're a lawyer. Well, who's the authority on who's a lawyer? Well, it's the Law Society, and they have a thing called a practicing certificate. It's in law. It's what they issue to a lawyer in good standing. So what if we could give the Law Society the ability to issue these things digitally? And that's what we're working with them for. So they'll add a, this print driver to their, to their member portal, a member can log in and request a credential and hold it in a, in a wallet. For me, I'm right now going to show like that I have a verified person credential, but this could be my Law Society credential. And in order to gain access to the new site, I simply go to the new site. I say access site. I'm going to use a credential to get in. I'm going to scan that code, which is requesting my lawyershipness. I say here it is. I present it. And I'm in. So that's the kind of experience we're looking for, right? Is like there was no integration between the Law Society and the BC Court Service. That's certainly a technical option. But what happens when the next service wants to provide access to lawyers? The land registry, the BC Services Registry, the registry in Alberta giving access to a BC lawyer. Like, is every service that needs to know a lawyer going to call up the BC Law Society and integrate with it? Not very practical. If we give the lawyer something that they can carry with them and provide evidence and it's trusted at a technical and a governance level, we're in good shape. So that's kind of like a little, um, a little preview into that. And then if I stop that share and I bring up another share. Um, let's go to this one. And I look at the, this is the this, we're not going to go into this detail, but just to say that what the trust over, here's the, here's the logo for the Trust Over IP Foundation, and its job is to facilitate global adoption of this, of this model. We need a way for businesses to understand what's being offered, that there's a clear and certain pattern that's being followed, and a way to evaluate technical and governance solutions that are being offered to them. And that's what this stack is about. Like in, in, in technology, um, we like to organize things so that we have an ability to evaluate things, the, the components of an overall system. And so that's what this diagram is getting at. And you know, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a technical, uh, not a nice graphic design version, but it provides the ability for somebody to evaluate the different aspects of an overall solution. And what's really important here, and what I'm very, pleased about as we bring this to the market is that it puts governance at an equal footing to technology. And that is where we've fallen down on the internet. We've, we've, we've relinquished control 
of things because we didn't pay attention to the fact that whoever owns the account service actually owns the relationship. And that's a governance fall down, not a technical fall down. And so the, um, you know, without getting into all the details of the levels, um, you know, each of these layers, there's an opportunity to deploy a technical solution. There's an opportunity to uh, govern that solution. There's an opportunity to define what interoperability means. And in the end, enable, you know, vast um, ecosystems of, of um, applications and services that could interoperate. That's the vision. And we have a number of organizations that are uh, founding this, um, including uh, uh, the government of British Columbia, MasterCard, Kiva, a large social enterprise service, IBM, Evernim, which is one of the startups in this space, and eSatis, which is a German company specializing in information security and working closely with the government and banks there. And we have dozens of other organizations that were actively engaged in discussions to launch this organization uh, 5th of May. And it is a Linux Foundation uh, organization as well, I should say, which is really important to us as they provide, you know, world class governance for open community building. That's a lot of pitch. That's awesome. Thanks, John. Uh, if people want more information on this, uh, how could they find out or find you? Uh, yeah, they can reach um, myself or Daryl or Drummond, um, you know, or perhaps they can just uh, contact you and we can provide, we can give, get us in touch. Awesome. Um, one of the projects that we had been working on um, was uh, in, in, out of all spaces in the firearm space in the US, where there, there is a real lack of, of trust that, you know, people have, um, some views about owning firearms and firearm regulations and stuff like that. Whereas on the other side, you have folks that um, are law abiding citizens, law abiding firearm owners, and they want to be able to prove that they're being actual responsible firearm owners. So by having digital proofs of, um, of firearm licenses, of training programs, of the right processes being followed when they're doing transfers at uh, gun shows and so forth. So, that, that was a very specific use case we worked on. And I, I think Daryl, it goes to, um, you know, I think in the short term, we have a similar view that there's going to be a lot of these very specific use cases where it just benefits like a specific ecosystem like this, like uh, firearm owners or like the credit unions. 